I think we should get start, started again. I'm, I'm Jeremy Sanders. I am, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Institutional Affairs, and uh, my main responsibility is around uh, the well being of 10,000 employees, and I'm particularly interested in equality and diversity. Um, gender matters uh, are something that's a very large part of my portfolio, so I'm very pleased to be able to be here, and I'm sorry I couldn't, I couldn't attend earlier on, but I've just come from chairing uh, an HR committee meeting. Uh, so our first speaker in this, in this last session uh, is Professor Ash Amin, who's a colleague in the Geography Department, uh, and uh, he tells me he's not going to directly address uh, gender questions, but anyway, Ash, uh, very looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank, thank you very much. I feel, I, I, feel, I feel like an interloper at this, uh, at this symposium, not, because, not just because of my own gender, because, but also because I won't speak to gender issues directly. But I think what I have to say uh, is of relevance. Um, I hope it is. Um, Elif Safak started off, or spoke of in the preceding session, about the freedoms of the of the private world, and particularly the, the world that we enter as we read books. And what I want to do is to focus on the freedoms or the trials of public space, of the, if you like, the inevitabilities of engagement in, the public, in public culture. And I want to do so pretty much in the context of uh, Britain and the West. And I'd like to begin with a, a famous uh, Rumi, the, the, the Sufi mystic Rumi in, in the 13th century, saying, he says, um, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing is a field. I will meet you there. Which is a very compelling statement that many, many people have quoted and misquoted, and I've misquoted in a book of mine. Uh, but I think um, it's this citation by, by uh, Rumi, citation of Rumi, is a ve it's a very good promise, I think, in our times of explosive and sharp identitarian divisions. And we heard of some of these identi the, the, the problems of identitarian politics in the preceding session. And indeed, much of Mona's work, I think, has absolutely watered this ground, this ground of encounter where right and wrongdoing come together uh, by showing us the connectedness between the connections between Islam and Christianity in her own writing and the lectures she gave here, uh, by really try, assiduously trying to recover the Illuminist or the Enlightenment tradition in Islamic thought, by speaking out against isolationism, sometimes with immense courage and also blame within the British Muslim community, um, and also speaking for femininity in Islam with immense empathy, as in the way that she did yesterday, I think, um, and almost counterintuitively. And this, her writing, her talks, uh, on the, the middle ground, are never dewy-eyed. They're not romantic, I don't think. But instead, I think she comes to that ground with a steely awareness of, of the things that can actually get in the way of meaningful dialogue. So, for instance, in a paper in, written in 2005 on reconciliation, she asks, and I quote, how can religious voices continue to mop up the mistakes and injustices inflicted by world leaders by trying to elevate religion to a position it does not enjoy? So politics intervenes. And in my uh, short contribution, what I want to do is I want to reflect on the making of the middle ground of encounter. Um, picking up on a very brief exchange that happened at the end of Mona's lecture yesterday on the rules and the moods of public space. There was a discussion about veiling and whether the, whether the French were right or wrong in, in expecting women to remove their veils in public and all the kind of the politics of faciality and of course all of these plays out in the public sphere either in, in public space or in public culture. Um, so that prompted me to think about this question 
what what is the middle ground what is the making of the middle ground of encounter and and how is this middle ground of encounter mediated because i think how the ground is mediated or how we understand the middle ground to be mediated might turn out to be quite crucial in terms of inflecting the quality of the encounter so for example today in britain the rub the enca- the rub in public culture between for in- for instance muslims and their interlocutors largely their enemies is constrained by at least three rather obstinate intermediaries one is uh, what i've described in a in a book i wrote recently called the land of strangers the foul air of a catastrophist biopolitics a biopolitics constructed in the context of 9/11 extreme climate change the formation of risk society in which anxieties pluralize primarily in the west but also in the east too um in such a way that politics and public culture beginning to pro- begin to project the future as almost constitutively perilous uncertain and actually no unknowable and one of the consequences i think of this kind of understanding of the future is a biopolitics that defines that has come to define community and security national or otherwise rather narrowly as the war between racialized bodies and racialized cultures um and in this scenario um in this kind of in ground of intermediation the other can only be imagined always as a as a foe as an enemy never is part of the homeland or a friend and i think in that context in the context of the biopolitics of uh catastrophism in 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 britain and elsewhere in europe uh the muslim and their counterpart get come to the table come to the zone of engagement of encounter only as pre-given and as incompatible and always complete and then another a uh, intermediary of the ground of encounter is of course a rather volatile everyday public culture the fragile and always contingent balance between on the one hand a conviviality that exists in public space particularly in the in urban metropolitan in cosmopolitan space where this conviviality is born out of the intermingling of strangers and the differences of gender race ethnicity for a moment sublimate, sublimate and disappear um so in super diverse britain as steve vertovich writes um what we begin to find is a fragile everyday getting along with each other in the context of those quick exchanges in the street but at the same time in that very same street inhabited by children muslims women whoever else um the judgments that occur in the street are also based on a very long legacy of what i what i would call phenotypical racism which is a quick fire sensory categorization of the outsider and, and particularly of minorities people who who look visibly different as inferior or is out of place which is partly why we obsess about the veil so in a sense in public space the veil becomes the medium through which the entire muslim body becomes categorized as this or that you are not allowed another plural identity and then thirdly another third intermediary if you like of the balances of public space and public culture i think i would call this the socio technologies of life chance for example um in thinking of the lives of muslims how immigration rules and integration policies how developments in the labor market in the housing market welfare discriminations and the age old maldistributions of race class and gender routinely return muslims women in particular 
um, to the bottom of the ladder of social mobility and civic recognition. So Rumi's field, it seems to me, is no tabula rasa. It's not a neutral ground. It is already very heavily predetermined. So what I want to turn to now in the next, in the five minutes that remain, is just to then think of some of the implications of such a reading of the ground of encounter. Um, to speak of the intermediations of public culture or public space, I don't think is necessarily to be against a politics of reconciliation. In today's climate of aversion and intolerance, almost as a kind of everyday habit, um, clearly we, whoever we are, should grab any opportunity for dialogue and reconciliation. But not, I think, at the expense of a politics of justice beyond the, interpers beyond the interpersonal. And that, that's what I want to get on to now. And I say this because if we recognize that the ground is always mediated, and very often politically mediated, or through the other machinations of public culture, then um, to make a case for a politics of justice beyond the interpersonal, um, I make that case because I think in our times, and this is a question that came up in the preceding session, um, I think such a politics, a politics, an, expl an explicit politics of justice, has almost disappeared off the political lexicon, off the political landscape. And so, for me, a politics of justice beyond the interpersonal would press for tangible reforms that begin to close the gap between the privileged and the disadvantaged, however defined and however understood. It would be acutely aware, I think, of the limitations of identitarian politics. And it would be interested in the shared commons and shared existential concerns that bridge difference, in the way I think Mona has tried to argue for a very long time. And this field, you could say, would be presided over, not just by Rumi, but perhaps also by Marx, and also by an early feminist, Mary Wollstonecraft, where now this uh, ground of encounter um, would begin to be occupied by disenfranchised Muslims and disenfranchised majorities, by environmentalists, by feminists, by social democrats, by workers and cosmopolitans, all of whom happen to be offended by the prevailing pathologies of our times, but the pathologies of cultural melancholia, the pathologies of market profligacy, and the pathologies of religious or secularist excess. I don't refer to the, I don't like the word funda fundamentalism, but I prefer the word secularist or religious excess. Um, joined together, keen on the open society that works for the many and not just the few. So the intermediaries of this ground for me are intersectional intermediaries, populated with fairly familiar campaigns certainly campaign, familiar campaigns of old, which need to be recovered, I think. Campaigns for universal welfare and human rights. Campaigns for equal access to the infrastructures of life. Campaigns really for the unlimited expansion of the cultural, the political and environmental commons. Campaigns for diplomacy as the ethic of conduct. And campaigns absolutely for shared legacies, Mary, Arabian Nights, the simple legacy of human being, and we heard from today the, the, the shared legacy, not quite a legacy yet, or the shared pleasure across cultures of reading A Thousand Splendid Sons. So this, for me, I think, is an awkward public sphere, uh, physical and virtual, a ground of encounter full of awkward silences, many, many disagreements, rather strange bedfellows too, and a ground in which there is an absolute quest for a future that's thought of and imagined as radically different, uh, much more expansive than the present or the past. So no nostalgia. Um, and I think such a public sphere with a new set of intermediaries 
um, is a public sphere clearly without guarantees, but we, which may, and I close, have, offer the advantage of at least three things. One is of not leaving the chances of the disenfranchised to the concessions of truth and reconciliation, or indeed to the concessions of identity. Secondly, where some labor is actively involved in designing the field itself, in which Rumi and Siddiqui want to see effective dialogue. By reinforcing, uh, um, I quote uh, uh, Silvia Federici, the, the feminist th thinker Silvia Federici, by reinforcing, I quote, processes of commoning rather than community. And then thirdly, and finally, um, if you like, an exercise of engineering of the public sphere in which there is explicit recognition and acceptance of our constitutive hybridity, every one of us. Despite what the communitarians amongst us and the individualists amongst us say, such that we, we're not then surprised at finding, as a, wonderful, a wonderfully clever PhD student, Ajmal Hussein, notes in the context of his research in Birmingham, I quote, where young Muslim women in hijab, simultaneously involved in candlelit vigils in show of solidarity for oppressed Afghan women, and then engaged also in slut walks in the liberal defense of women's rights in the UK. So here is an example, I think, where we have a public sphere in which the culture of that public sphere is not one in which we are forced to conform to the stereotype or to play to the ascribed role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ash. And our next speaker is Haifa Zangan. And I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. Is uh, who is an Iraqi novelist and uh, artist and political activist who's been in Britain now since 1976, I think. Right. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Muna. I is, uh, I am a very keen listener of your comments, and actually I am today here to, do, uh, to speak about few things happening in Iraq today, and it is totally related to the topic of the seminar, which is feminism, religion, and women's rights, but also I'm very keen to hear what you all think about it, and Muna uh, especially. Well, feminism, in, sadly, is associated nowadays. I mean, earlier uh, we, spoke, we heard about Egypt and Afghanistan, and we know the war on terror was, uh, to start with, targeting Afghanistan and then moved on from Afghanistan to the uh, triangle of evil, starting in Iraq, and stopped there but it continued in other forms. It's, it's moved on to occupation. Uh, the invasion was followed by the occupation, and now we have indirect occupation, which is called uh, uh, kind of, uh, if we use the terminology by the US military, it's a sustainable violence or a low level war. So when I'm talking about, I'm going to say occupation, I am really referring to the low-level war as it's being used by the United States and the British uh, government. So feminism is associated, sadly, in Iraq with colonious, colonial feminism and feminist. Uh, I'll explain. Uh, US policy towards NGO, uh, NGOs was for reformulated in the aftermath of September the 11th, uh, again, and it's uh, several US funded uh, women, Iraqi women's organizations were established either immediately before or after. So within one month uh, of the launch of the war on Iraq in 2003, we noticed the emergencies or the, of many women organizations and when many women groups funded by the US and the first time, for the first time being uh, offered a platform to voice uh, their 
plights under Saddam's regime. And one of them, I'm using it as an example, is called Women for uh, Free Iraq, where 50 women, 50 Iraqi women, were collected, almost handpicked, and being paraded in Washington, D.C. on March the 6th, like 11 days before the invasion. They all described themselves as NGOs and began working in Iraq. Then when they moved to Iraq uh, with the invasion, they were uh, working and representing, like uh, after the mission accomplished, uh, they were rewarded with posts within the government, either cabinet ministers or highly uh, regarded places. Uh, in their statement, uh, Women for Free Iraq sang homeless to U.S. administration, offered their support, I quote, to President Bush for his principled leadership, unquote. Thus, they became being, they, I quote, being grateful to the Americans for liberating us has become the bismillah of their speeches, media interviews, press conferences, and photo opportunities with U.S. officials and inside Iraq they were rewarded. So it's, they worked inside Iraq relentlessly uh, to echo the US policy as well uh, and call for the war on Iraq. But I mean, there were other groups. That doesn't mean all women NGOs or all women, all feminists were this kind of feminists, but they became predominantly there because they've been part of the government and the political process to build up or to, to say, well, this is, we are building democracy for Iraq. Now, so we have to notice the association, democracy, women's rights, and the colonial feminist or feminist in general. So this kind of combination, it's became lethal in Iraqi society for people to feel really angry about all these issues. They became bad words altogether put in one basket. And this has, uh, until now, damaged the uh, independent voices, damage the work of women organization, and damage, damage even any prospects of working on human rights. It, when I talk to uh, young people and women about the human rights in Iraq now, they laugh at me. They say, well, what's the point? Look at what's happening to us. Look at uh, the democracy they brought to us. So this association became really, and this is happening also not just in Iraq. I, I work with women in, uh, in Egypt. I work in, with them in, in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, and they tell me the same story. They talk about the, the whole thing. There were other voices, obviously, and uh, women been working very hard. In fact, I mean, Iraqi women very famous for her for their struggle over decades, over a century, in order to reach the point where they were very active in building the modern Iraqi state, building the country. And re we reached, in fact, in the 70s and before the Iraq-Iran war to the, what we can call, if we, if we look at the Muslim uh, triangle, we reached the top where it is almost the gender equality in Iraq. Uh, we had it there. Sadly, we didn't have the political freedom, but when it comes to women's rights through laws uh, and the implementing of laws, various of them, we reached very high sophisticated place uh, at that time. Uh, the response to the, this kind of colonial feminism uh, as is seen as the clearest uh, picture in Iraq uh, was really counteracted by other groups of women who were in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, like there were nine women's organizations signed a statement. This is before the invasion of Iraq against the war. They were stating, and I'm quoting, we Arab women say no to the war against Iraq because we are certain that when armies invade, only destruction will prevail, which is absolutely what's happened. The destruction in Iraq is huge by all standards. And women are part of that destruction. So it is really, I mean, we, we be, I've been brought up in, in, in the Iraq that combined women's rights with national liberation movement. So it is to get rid 
uh, to be liberated from the colonial powers because we were colonized by the British to start with. And then 1958, we were liberated. Within two years, from 1958 to 1960, Iraq achieved, and women with men, both of them, achieved what the colonialism and what the previous like took 50 years to achieve in two years. We did the change of laws, uh, the women's rights, human rights, everything happened so quickly, amazing, regarding education, regarding issuing one of the most advanced uh, family laws in the Middle East was issued in 1959. And that is what the Iraqi government now, I mean, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit, is trying to abolish. And this is linked also to religion. Uh, what, what is religion for Iraqis? I mean, uh, Iraq, although, I mean, in the, uh, we, many people say uh, Iraq is a secular country or was a secular country under Saddam. Uh, and uh, this is really, I mean, uh, it's not, that's not true. I think deep down and in all manifestation in our daily life, we, it's a country where religion is there, but not the religion that you, you grow a beard or you wear a veil. Uh, religion is a culture, uh, it's the architecture, it's the Quran, the Quran which is really the most beautiful language, which we study at school in order to have beautiful language. This is the unite uh, millions of people, the language of the Quran. It's the beauty of the, also, I mean, there are words in the, what combine us is if we leave aside the punishment and everything which you pick up sometimes on the, uh, on Islam and the Quran, you'll see there are so many beautiful human things in the Quran itself. And this is what we've been brought up to. We were in a way, secular religious, if we can say that. And as my uh, Yemeni friend would say, and she's an activist within uh, groups of uh, women organization, and she is in the mountain and all, she would say, well, we, we, didn't, we don't even know the meaning of the word secular. And this woman is a communist who <laughs> was telling me, she said, we call it civil rather than secular. And I've seen in Algeria, when I was there, a, a, a prominent member of the Communist Party who will jump and go to pray. And I was shocked. I said, you praying? You're a communist. What's happened to Marx and Lenin? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they said, but there no contradiction. This is this and that. This is, uh, and we, we know that in Latin America, Catholics and the church works within. Uh, the National Liberation Movement as well as uh, the, 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 the rest of the uh, population and the movement. So it is the relationship between the colonial and the colonialized also, which we mustn't forget when we talk about women's rights, about human rights. What push people to be really extremist uh, from one end to another, and we've seen it in Iraq, we've seen it very clearly in Iraq, is suddenly, it's not a sudden, this growth of what they call radical movement, Islamist movement, or whatever they call it, it's not sudden. It came gradual, and it's been brought up through the injustice. If you don't deal with injustice, if you live through hypocrisy, if you live with double standard, you, will going to, you are going to face uh, this kind of radicalism. And also, the occupation and invasion of Iraq uh, made people return to what is familiar to them deep down. It is like during the French uh, occupation, the Nazis, the French occupation, the French people who were not religious people, they went back to the small village for protection, to keep their identity, to protect their existence, which is really engulfing the identity. And this is what Iraqis did what Iraq is doing and doing this. So it's, it is in the religion, it is in the Quran, is what we, is, we celebrating a rahmah, which is kindness, forgiveness, uh, reason. Reason has been aql 
uh, is mentioned in the Quran 49 times. Learning, ilm, 108 times. And kindness, 300 times. It's, and it ex expressly prohibits the killing of non-combatants. Non Women, children, the aged, even trees. We should care about trees. By the way, the Americans, and this is somehow, I, I don't know why, but when I went to Baghdad and I've seen it, I, I just cried. And I'm not a woman who, who cries easily. But I saw they cut the trees, the Americans. Why? Because they say, think terrorists behind them, they might attack us. And I saw Baghdad bear which is, it used to be full of palm trees and tree. We spend millions, if not billions, of money on because of the desert weather to protect Baghdad, to protect the people. We had to have trees. They chop them, and you look at like amputated people there because people, the resistance was hiding behind them. So this is, Islam does not say that. Well, anyway. I'm not really justifying a lot of things because now by the, using the name of Islam, many terrible things are going to be legalized now. We, there is a government at the moment which is not religious, it's not Muslim, Islamic, or Islamist, but it is sectarian. And so we are almost fragmenting the fragmented already in the society. Uh, people from other religions are targeted as much as the Muslims themselves targeted. So Iraq, which been very rich, proud with the mosaic we had. It's like uh, I, I belong to uh, a Muslim, uh, mixed Shia, Sunni, and Arab Kurd I am. A Kurd, uh, and our neighbors were the Sabi'ain, one of the oldest religions and land, and they only in south of Iraq and part of Iran, the Christians, the Yazidis, we had them all. We lived together with them. Now Iraq is emptying of that. It's, there are forces that are growing there, uh, holding the power and listening and obeying uh, whatever outside is the link is there. And, and they still use the rhetoric of democracy and human rights and everything is, but in practice they are really is a sectarian corrupt government which is trying to cover up this corruption now with using Islam. Now the most recent thing is on the 25th of February, uh, the, the Iraqi Council of Ministers approved a new personal status law. This is going to change the 1959 law, which considered to be the most advanced in the Middle East regarding women and children and the whole family altogether. So this new law is called Ja'fari law, and it is named after the sixth Shia Imam, uh, Imam Ja'far Sadiq. It was submitted, it was approved by the council and it was submitted to parliament for approval. So now we are in a stage when we can still maybe uh, put an end to this. So what, what, what is this, uh, the, the law, what is it? I mean, the, the current law uh, is, let me just go through, it stipulates the following, the legal age of marriage, the current law, uh, for both men and women is 18. Uh, polygamy is prohibited uh, and taking a second wife is extremely restricted uh, unless you have a special permission from a judge, from your ex-wife, uh, from anybody, is, is almost you can be fine, put in a prison if you have a second wife. This is what it is, extremely restricted. A Muslim male is allowed to marry a non-Muslim female without conditions or restrictions. A woman can disobey her husband if he behaves tyrannically and harms her by failing to provide adequate housing or care should she fall ill. This is only few articles of the old 1959 law. Right, what is the new suggested Ja'fari law? It reads, uh, legal age for marriage for females is nine and males at 15. 
and could be even lower with the consent of the guardian be a father or a grandfather. So we are legalizing child marriage now. Article 104 permits unconditional polygamy, but in, in fact, it goes further because it advises <coughs> a man how to spend his four nights together. And the details are really, really, uh, I, it, it makes some read. I mean, we talk about literature, uh, it, it makes kind of uh, things. Article 101, men have the right to enjoy, I quote, because this is the word used, enjoy sex with their wives anytime they want, and wives cannot leave <coughs> their marital house without their husband's permission. Then husbands are not required to pay financial support, nafaqa, when a wife is either a minor or a senior, and hence unable to sexually satisfy them. This is the other one. Also, it prevents Muslim males from permanently marrying non-Muslim females. Now, take notice of the word permanently, because this is important. What's happening now is we have a new phenomenon which go to be pre-Islam, and this is called muta, is the marriage, temporary marriage, which is for enjoyment is. A muta means a man who wants to have sex with a woman marries her in presence of a religious figure who acts as a mut'a broker. The man will specify how long the marriage will last, ranging from few hours, sometimes 10 minutes, depends, uh, to many years. A smaller dowry will then be paid to the woman. Such marriages have no protection or guarantees for women or their offspring in Iraq. Only a man has the right to renew it when it expires or terminated early. And temporary marriages and unregistered marriages, they are not registered in civil courts, and they were prohibited totally before 2003 in Iraq. So these are, I mean, uh, I am not going through all the articles. It's, it's really something. But uh, this defy and in a breach all of, of all Iraqi laws, international agreements, and United Nations Convention so, which Iraq ratified on human rights, in particular of women and children. It uh, legalized rape. Uh, it will put an end to girls' education. I mean, because if at the age of nine, is a child is uh, getting married, so and at the age of 12, maybe having a baby, and she's a, a child, having a child, uh, this is an end to education. Education is one of the most important things which we struggled for in Iraq and for many, many decades. And we reached to the extent, like if you have only the university degree, you look down at. You have to have a postgraduate degree. Now we take it back, a hundred years back, by issuing these laws. Is this will also reduce women to being sexual tools and legalize their punishment if they dare to object. It will put an end to interreligious. This is a hugely important political issue because the problem in Northern Ireland uh, is there is no uh, interreligious, uh, intercommunity marriages, one of the main problems there. So if we start this, not marrying non-Muslim or not marrying a Shia from uh, a Sunni or a Sunni from Shia. So uh, this is definitely the end of Iraqi society as we know it, both of them. So what is the justification for this law? How they uh, present it to the people? I'm quoting one of the, uh, the Shia lawmaker who is uh, prominent into presenting it, he says, this is the core of the freedom. Based on the Iraqi constitution, each component of the Iraqi people has the right to regulate its personal status in line with the instructions of its religion and doctrine. Uh, this is it. That means in each religion got its own law to work on it or to follow it or to regulate a family. So what will happen to families which by family, for example? How are we going to regulate our affairs? Obviously, there is a, a huge outcry about it by women. 
independent women. There are demonstrations now. There are meetings. Uh, the United Nations representative to Iraq is speaking about it, also condemning or at least saying, well, this is really a risk. Uh, it doesn't protect rights for women and international commitment. But what about women MPs? Because we have one of the highest quota of women MPs, almost like uh, higher than Britain, by the way, and higher than America. In America, I think it's 18% or something. We have 25% uh, in Iraq. And this is, this is the quota which has been forced uh, in the Constitution by Paul Bremer. So the US uh, military uh, ruler forced it in order to promote women's rights. Uh, so women MP, one of the most uh, spoken women, outspoken women, her name Suzanne Assad, uh, she, did, she said is when she was asked about it and she was asked if she, what, what, your child is nine years old, would you uh, accept marrying? She said yes, because it is a divine sharia. It is a must, but it isn't a must. It's not a sharia. We have to really, I mean, that might be presented to the world as a Sharia. It isn't, because at the same time, Association of Muslim <coughs> Scholars in Iraq uh, did not agree, and they issued very powerful statements saying this is not Sharia as we know it. As you know, it's, it depends on interpretations, and it seems like those political parties, and they asking for the country and the ministers and the cabinet to withdraw this law uh, because it's going to establish or deepen the sectarian nature uh, in, in the society. This law, no matter how it is marked, will damage what Iraqi women have been struggling to get rid of for over a century. And it is a huge degrading step backward to Iraqi men and women alike. It is important in, in our case anyway, and I see it like in, I've seen it in Egypt, I've been there, it's, uh, I've been in Tunisia and other countries. It's always, it's very important, men are together with women. It's, we never separated that. We've been working together, and this is the only way. So as Muna mentioned earlier, I totally agree with her. It is a human rights which should be universal, which we, do, we are working on, rather than fragmenting these uh, various issues. And thank you very much. Well, thank you for that very, very moving and, and passionate uh, statement. Uh, no, no. Can everyone hear me now? Good. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ash, for a very thoughtful response, and uh, thank you also, Haifa, for a very moving um, appraisal of what's happening in Iraq. I think you, at one point, Ash, you said Rumi and Siddiqui. Maybe I misheard. But I just want to say, I've never had Rumi and Siddiqui in a sentence about me before. <laughs> but I did, it did make me think of the place Rumi could actually play in any kind of dialogue. And I was asked to do a profile, there was a profile of me in the Christian Century, um, sorry, in the Church Times a few months ago. And one of the questions was, if you were locked up in a mosque for a day, who would you want to be locked up with? And I said, first of all, I don't want to be locked up in any mosque. But if I had to be, it would be Rumi. So it was a nice reminder. Rumi also said, I am surrounded by people in the darkness of the night, but if only I could find a human being. And it kind of makes you think that in our public space, um, and trying to draw together, and I'll speak very briefly because I want to leave more time for Q&A. In our public space, where do we, how do we instill people to have the courage to voice opinions? For me, the, pub, the best kind of public space is not one where we learn to agree, but where we learn how to disagree. And I think that the majority of the problems that we're finding in the Islamic world is that we don't know how to disagree civilly. And that's why you have a brain drain. That's why you have people who want to say things who migrate to the West. Because for all the problems in the West, 
we know still how to disagree to an extent. We, we, we can go further, but we know how to, to disagree. You said a lot about Sharia, and um, I'll just go back to my first talk, which was unless we demystify what Sharia is, especially in countries where people exert huge control and power over society in the name of Sharia, that Sharia is man-made. It may have divine origin, that's entirely the interpretation, but it's a man-made law. That unless you think that human law and human laws evolve according to human development, according to human moral agency, they're not static. We're not static. We've evolved in so many ways. Okay, we still show signs of medievalism, of barbarism, of ancient ways of thinking, but we have laws in place for a reason to stop us from exerting those things that make the public space difficult, that make relationships impossible, that make our whole society, which is increasingly becoming pluralist, impossible to live in. And I think that what's what happened in Pakistan, what's happening in Iraq, what's happening in, um, and just on the Iraq one, a few years ago, um, somebody quite high up from the American diplomatic corps asked me, he said, what do you think we did wrong in Iraq? <laughs> And it was a tea break, so I didn't have long enough. And I said, the only thing I would say is that you didn't treat Iraq as a country, as a civilization, as a people. You saw it as a place that needed battering to death for your own purposes. And he said, yes, many of us feel like that, but not many of us can say that. And I think unless we see, and it takes us back to our initial conversation about otherness, that in the end, where we are, I know it sounds such a cheesy cliche, but actually we are all the same, that when you leave a country, you're still leaving that country with all the problems, with all the anxieties. You've, if, if anything, you've perhaps polarized that country even more. So the fact that we've now got Sharia, Jafri law, and specifically from what you're outlining when it comes to personal law and marriage, this is simply a way of controlling women. It's nothing more than that. And as soon as you say this is Sharia, you're cutting off a conversation. You're not starting a conversation because you're sacralizing it. You're saying this is what God wants. The virtuous woman, the pious woman, will be there for her husband, will be married off at the age of nine and not, and not turn against that, will be there to do what all the male members in her family say. Now, some women might think that's okay, and I'm not going to say anything against that. But for a lot of people, a lot of women and men, this is not the right way to be. And I don't think anyone, anyone in this room would contest that. Because for all the politeness we have about other cultures and how the West shouldn't intrude and how human rights, can they be universal or are they indigenous and local? There are some things I think that are local, that, that are universal. There are some things that speak to us as human beings irrespective of our background, our culture, our identity, our sex, whatever. And to some extent, you could argue, whichever way we go at the moment, we go west. And I don't mean by west in terms of the colonization and all the rest. I mean by west in the, same, in the sense that human rights speak for something. And most Muslim societies know that human rights are a good thing. That human rights is what they see in the west, which is what they like about the west, notwithstanding all the other issues they have. So I. I don't know what to say to what you're facing. The only question, and maybe this will come out, and I'll end on this, is you said in those two years, Iraqi government had made so, or society had made so much progress. And I just wondered what was unique to Iraq at the time that in two years you made so much progress in so many areas? How did people just come, how did people just come together for that kind of transformation? Thank you.